In section 10.7, we're going to do marginal analysis. Marginal analysis is a business application involving uh, cost, revenues, and profit. So first up is what is the definition of the word marginal? Marginal means rate of change. So if you're going to compute the rate of change, what do we use in calculus? The derivative. The derivative. All right, so a couple of things to know here is the symbols. Now, uh, a lot of this uh, back story comes from 1319, so hopefully you all have 1319. But we're going to use C for cost, R for revenue, and P for profit. With those, what is the marginal cost? C prime. Marginal revenue? R prime and marginal profit, P prime. Now, one thing to, to make sure we're all on the same page, there is a difference between revenue and profit. Revenue is simply money coming in without regard to anything else. Profit is what you have left over after revenues have come in and the cost have gone out. So profit is the, your revenues minus your cost. As such, what is marginal profit? Yeah, marginal revenue minus marginal cost. And again, what does marginal mean? It's the rate of change. So marginal revenue is how your revenue is changing at a uh, particular production level. Your marginal cost are how your costs are changing at a particular cost level, a uh, production level. All right. Example one. A company makes toasters. The total weekly cost for producing X toasters is given by C of X is equal to 3,000 plus 40X minus 0.03X squared. Question A. What is the exact cost of producing the 101st toaster. <coughs> so if we're looking for exact cost, that is delta C. So exact again from the previous lesson is delta something. So if we want delta C, uh, uh, then that will give us the exact cost. Now, here's, here's the way this works. When I put in an X value for the function in the C, then that tells me the cost of producing that many toasters from the first toaster all the way up to that toaster. Okay. So if I put in 100, that is the cost of producing all 100 toasters. If I put in 101, what is that? That's the cost of producing all of the toasters, first, second, all the way up to the 101st toaster. So the cost of producing the 101st toaster, the one toaster that is the 101st down the line, is the cost of producing all 101 minus the cost of producing the first 100. So it's the cost of producing 101 toasters minus the cost of producing the first 100 toasters. Okay. If you were drawing a little a little diagram here, it might look something like this. Right? Here is the cost of producing 100 toasters in this bar right here. And then the cost of producing 101 toasters is all of this up to that point, 101. So the cost of producing the 101st toaster is merely just this piece right here at the end. So you're going to take 100, the cost of 101 minus the cost of 100. All right. When you plug this in, what do we get? This is going to be 3,000 plus 40 times 101 minus 0 0.03 times 101 squared minus 3,000 plus 40 times 100 minus 0 0.03 times 100 squared.
And when you figure that out, you get $33.97. So the cost of producing just the 101st toaster is $33.97. Also something that was a sort of subtle, that, was, that we didn't explicitly mention, but it's, it's inherent in the function. The cost of producing a particular toaster depends on how many toasters you've already made, right? So, so consider stuff like your fixed cost. The cost of opening a building and running the lights and the plumbing and the water and all this sort of stuff. Uh, that doesn't change much depending on how many things you produce, right? So for example, if we were going to produce toasters in this room, we've got to run the lights in here all day, regardless of if we make 50 toasters or if we make 2,000. The lights are going to run, and that's, that's a fixed cost, right? The more toasters I make, the less it costs for that toaster because we're already paying for some of these things. Let's look at question B. Find the marginal cost function. So the cost function, again, was 3,000 plus 40x minus x, oops, minus... <coughs> 0.03x squared. So how do I find marginal cost? Derivative. Take the derivative. So the marginal cost function is the derivative of the C function. What's the derivative of 3,000? What's the derivative of 40x? 40. And what's the derivative of negative 0.03x squared? Yeah, negative 0.06x. Yeah. Question C. Approximate the cost of producing the 101st toaster using marginal cost. So this is the tricky part of the question. What value of x do you plug in to find the marginal cost of producing the 101st toaster. You plug in 100, because this is just like the differentials and the increments. You're asking how much is the change from going from the 100 level to the 101 level. So, so you are going to plug in 100 into C prime of X. That's 40 minus 0 0.06 times 100, which is $34 on the money. How does that compare with our exact uh, cost for the toaster? Pretty close, yeah. The exact cost was $33.97. This is $34 a year. Okay? But once again, I cannot over overstress this. You're you're looking at increments again, basically, and approximating them with differentials. This is basically a differential. What is the if you thought of this as a differential, what would it be? It would be sort of C uh, D C is equal to C prime of a hundred times DX. But what's the DX? How many toasters are we increasing by? Just one. So DC is actually just C prime of 100. That's basically what's going on. All right. Example two. A company will manufacture and market uh, a new DVD player. The research department has determined the following represents the price demand equation. 300, X is equal to 300 minus 5P. The financial department has determined that the cost of producing X DVD players is C of X is equal to 2,000 plus 10X. Question A. Solve the price demand function for P and find the domain of the function P of X. All right. So this equation is called a price demand function. The demand is the X, and the P is the price. The P is the price per unit. Now, um, 
let me go through the scenario that I normally go with, go into with my 1319 students. So, that, so I make sure you all have the sort of the same background. The price that you pay for items depends on the number of items you are willing to buy. This is Walmart versus Sam's Club. If you go to Walmart and you want to buy Snickers, right? They will sell you one Snickers for one dollar, right? Okay. How does that change when you go to Sam's Club? What do you buy instead? You buy 40 Snickers. Now, because you're doing that, what does Sam's Club do for you? They lower the price per Snickers. So you may buy 40 Snickers, but not at a dollar each. You would buy them at 80 cents each. And if I bought less than 40, maybe if I bought 20, then you should expect to pay somewhere between 80 cents and a dollar, maybe 90 cents, something like this. All of that is controlled by the price-demand function because you demand so many Snickers and they offer them up at a certain price. That's the way it works. Okay? So the more you buy, the less you should expect to pay per item. That doesn't mean you're going to pay less money, but you're paying less per item. All right, example A, find and uh, solve the price demand function for P. So we're just going to solve this for P. So it's going to move the P over here. So it's 5P is equal to 300 minus X. And then divide both sides by 5. What is 300 divided by 5? 60. What is 1 divided by 5? Next, we need to find the domain. The domain is going to be in terms of x. What is the least number of DVDs I could buy? And we'll even and we'll even go further than that. Let's say zero. Let's say zero. We'll close it off at the end. What is the most DVD players that I could buy so that this equation still makes sense? So what do you what do you know about the price of an item? What's the pretty much the only restriction we have on price? It's non negative, right? So so the P has to be greater than or equal to zero. If P is greater than or equal to zero, then I have, let me work this over here. If the P is greater than or equal to zero, that means 60 minus 0.2x is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to move the 60 to the other side. That becomes negative. Divide both sides by negative 0 0.2. What is negative 60 divided by negative 0 0.2? That's 300. And one little algebra gem. What happened here? Yeah. We flipped the sign because you divided or multiplied by a negative number. And that gives me the upper bound. So the domain is, in fact, 0 to 300. What this means is that if, if there is a company selling uh, DVDs and such, then uh, this price demand function is only going to work if you're selling between 0 and 300. If you go beyond 300, then your price structure goes negative and you can't have that. Uh, there's also one other way to know what the, what the domain was. Does anyone know what it is? Right here in this graph, 0 to 300. There it is. That's the end of it right there. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Let's take a look at the uh, marginal cost function. All right. So find and interpret marginal cost. So the cost function was C of X is equal to 2,000 plus 10X. And here, marginal cost, we'll take the derivative. 
the derivative of 2,000 is 0, the derivative of 10x is 10. So in this case, we know that the marginal cost is constantly 10. And so it doesn't matter if I'm making uh, 5 DVDs or 20 or 100, the cost, uh, marginal cost for more DVDs is always $10 each. Okay. Uh, so, so it's constant. This is the interpretation. So it's constant, which means uh, it costs an additional ten dollars for each uh, DVD player. Question C, find the revenue function and its domain. So remember what revenue is. Revenue is equal to the number of items you're buying times the price per item. So that is x times p of x. So the price demand function was 60 minus 0.2x and then we will multiply that out and get 60x minus 0.2x squared. The, and this is just the revenue function, it's not even marginal revenue, it's just revenue. The domain, if you don't know this one, write this down. Domain of revenue is inherited from the domain of the price demand function. So the domain of the revenue function is the same as the domain from the price demand function. 0 to 300. Um, will the demand always start with 0? Uh, no. Uh, for all the ones that we'll generate, we'll start them at 0. But you could have you could have a uh, a structure where it starts at five or ten or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the key is to look at the problem, and sometimes it'll have like um, an inequality beside the equation. That'll be the domain. So it'll, so it'll be like equation, and then five is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to twenty. Then five to twenty is the domain. Yeah, very good. Question D. Find the rev uh, marginal revenue at each of these production levels and interpret the results. <coughs> so the revenue function is 60x minus 0.2x squared. The marginal revenue is the derivative. So that would be 60 minus 0.4x. And then we want to know the marginal revenue at each of the following production levels. So the X's represent the number of DVD players. So let me just do a couple of these here. So uh, the marginal revenue evaluated at 100 would be 60 minus 0 0.4 times 100. And that's $20. The marginal revenue at 150 DVD players is 60 minus 0 0.4 times 150, which is zero dollars.
and the marginal revenue at 200 DVD players is negative $20. Now, the interpretation always goes something like this. And I'll do it for this one here and, and then talk to you, talk you through do it, changing it for other ones. At a production level of 100 DVDs, Revenue is increasing at twenty dollars per DVD. So that is the written interpretation of this equation here. I underlined increasing because this is the wording that you'll change if this number happens to be negative. If this is negative, what do you change it to? It's decreasing. And at the same time, you change whatever the answer is to its positive version. Okay? So if we were going to do the last one, we would say at a production level of 100, I'm sorry, at a production level of 200 DVDs, revenue is decreasing at $20 per DVD. So the negative gets incorporated into the verbiage. You will use it as the, as the word. Question E. Graph the cost function and the revenue function on the same coordinate system. Find the intersection points of these graphs and interpret. Uh, the graph has been provided for you on the other page. Go back. There is the graph. Uh, this is the cost function, and this is the revenue function. And they intersect at this point and at this point. What are those two points called? <coughs> a new? new? No, it's, it's a business term. You're all business majors, right? What? Profit is when your revenues exceed your cost. Equilibrium. Uh, getting warmer, Carl. <laughs> the break-even point. Yeah. Ah. That's the break-even point. Yeah. Let's go ahead and put in profit and everything here too. So let's see here. Where, Gina, where is the profit? Yeah, above the line, above the cost, but within, but within the revenue, right? So see right here, this little green section is going to be profit. And what do we call it when your cost exceed your revenues? Would be this area here where your costs are bigger than. Uh, there's another word that they use in this book. Loss. Yeah. Yeah. This is called loss. Loss. So you have profit and you have loss. And. So the, there, there are two points on this graph where your cost and your revenue are exactly equal. That's where you break even. Break even means the amount of money that came in was exactly equal to the amount of money that went out. So you broke even. Fantastic. Now, uh, now, do you see what these answers are? What are the break even points, by the way? What's the, what is, what is the number of DVDs that you should produce in order to break even? 50 and 200. Now, you'll be asked to show this calculation on a test or quiz in the near future. So, 
Uh, let me show you how to do that calculation at this time. You want to know the break-even points. <coughs> the break-even points are where your revenues are equal to your cost. So that is what you do. You set your revenues equal to your cost. So the revenue function was 60x minus 0.2x squared. Your cost function was 200, uh, sorry, 2000 plus 10x. This is a quadratic. So we need to move everybody to the left and then solve it using either factoring or the quadratic formula. So I'm going to move everybody to the left. I'm going to put it in order so the x squared term comes first. 10x moves to the left as a negative and it combines with the 60x to give me 50x. And the 2000 moves from the right to the left of the negative as well, giving me negative 2,000, and then it's equal to zero. Now, understandably, it's hard to work with quadratics when they don't have uh, an integer for the x squared term. So I'm going to multiply by negative 5. And I'll do this, I'll write it in red here. I'm going to multiply this by negative 5 so that I can get rid of the coefficient of the x squared term. Because I know that negative 5 times negative 0.2 is 1. So that becomes 1x squared. But if I do it there, i got to do it to all of them. I have to do it to the right side too, but the right side is 0, so 0 times negative 5 is just 0. Negative 5 times 50 is negative 250, so that's negative 250x. And negative 5 times negative 2,000 is positive 10 large, right there, 10,000. All right, <clears throat> that's gangster talk. All right, <laughs> so now what do we do? Now what do we do? Now we factor. This is plus and that's minus. Since this is plus, they're both the same. They are the same in that it's the same sign there. And the question for you is, what two numbers multiply to give you 10,000 and add to give you 250? Yeah. Teresa, do you know? You look like you knew it. Oh, no, I don't know. oh the false. It's false. Yeah, no heckling from the front row. 250. 250. How did you know that? Uh-huh. What else? Who's the numbers on that chart I gave you? <laughs> 50 and 200. I mean, it's the same numbers. So this is x equals 50 and x equals 200. This should not be a surprise. All right. Okay. So those are the break-even points. Now... Uh, the interpretation of that is the break-even points, which is where profit is equal to zero. All right. Oops. Erase that. Let's finish this problem up, and then we'll call it a day. Find the profit function. So the profit function is the revenue function minus the cost function. So this is 60x minus 0.2x squared minus, parentheses, 2,000 plus 10x. Then you simplify this. It's going to be a quadratic, as expected. And uh, we'll put it in, put the terms in order here. It's very much related to the last calculation we did. Because if you're finding the break-even points, you are finding where profit is zero. So it's the same thing as taking this equation and setting it equal to zero, which is exactly what this is right here. Setting, it's being set equal to zero. G, find the marginal profit at x equals 50, 125, and, uh, and x equals 200. Interpret, and how many should be produced to max <coughs> maximize profit? Mm -hmm. 
and then you would plug in some of these. I'm sure you can do this. So I'm just going to give you the answers. That would be 30. At 125, it's 0. And at 200, it's minus 30. Now, remember, these are the marginal profits. They're not profits themselves. Marginal profit tells us how profit is changing. So, in particular, the profit at, at a production level of 120 is 0, meaning it's no longer rising and it's no longer, it's not falling yet. So this is actually the maximum number of DVDs that you should, you should get. Uh, another important thing to remember is that maximum profit does not occur at maximum revenue. Those are different concepts. Okay? So the maximum revenue happened at 150. The maximum profit occurs at 125. One more thing to show you here is one way to think about profit is to think of profit as the difference between cost and revenue. So it's, it's like a big vertical bar here. So the length of this vertical bar is the profit. And so the profit is largest where these graphs separate the largest with the revenue on top. And this is it right here. This is x equals 125, which is maximum profit. All right, let's continue now in section 10.7 with marginal average cost, marginal average revenue, and marginal average profit. So what does it mean to be the average? Well, we're talking on a per unit basis now. So it's a, a way of figuring out how much each individual item you're producing or, or selling is costing you, and then uh, we're going to do the marginal aspect of that as well to see how much each additional item changes the cost on average. <clears throat> so the symbol for average, pretty much throughout mathematics, is to take whatever symbol it is you're talking about, for instance, cost, and put a big bar over it. So this is the average cost function, the average revenue function, and the average profit function. And you're only putting the bar over the letter, not the function part of the deal. The formula for the average for each of these things is to take the, uh, the total function value, whatever that is, in this case it's cost, and then divide it by the number of things being produced. Well, that's what X is. X represents the number of things you're producing or selling or, or whatever. So average cost is the total value of the cost for producing X items divided by the number of items you produce, which is X. And of course this is variable. And similarly, average revenue is R over X and average profit is P over X. Now, if we take each of these three functions, we can find the marginal version of that function by taking the derivative. So the symbol here would be C bar prime of X, R bar prime of X, and P bar prime of X. And when you go to calculate the marginal average cost or any one of these, you find the average first and then take the derivative. Okay, so the derivative is the last thing you do. Let's look at example three. The total profit in dollars from the sale of X radios is P of X equals 19X minus 0.05X squared minus 120 for x between 0 and 350. Find the average profit per radio if 180 radios are produced. So we're looking for average profit. The formula for average profit is to take the profit function and divide by x.
So this would be 19x minus 0.05x squared minus 120, 120 divided by x. Then we'll take the average profit function and evaluate at 180 to find the average profit per radio when 180 radios are produced. If you work that up, you get $9.33. So that is the average profit per radio at a production level of 180 radios. Part B is find the marginal average profit at a production level of 180. Interpret the results. So we need to start with the average profit function, and we need to take its derivative. Now, we have not learned one of the rules for taking derivatives that's called the quotient rule, which is what you do whenever you have a, a fraction like this. So we're going to need to do some algebra first, and then we can take this derivative. Had we known the quotient rule, we could take it right away, but we don't learn the quotient rule until Chapter 11. So I'm going to need to rewrite this a little bit. And I'm going to do that by dividing the x into every single part. Really what you're doing is you're sort of uncombining the fraction, right? splitting it up. And then we can simplify this. 19x over x is just 19. Negative 0.05x squared divided by x. Well, we cancel one of the x's. And the last term stays the same. We, in order to take this derivative, see, the only thing you know how to take derivatives of right now are just flat line stuff. That's why every time there's something in the denominator, I have you raise it to the top. You don't know how to do this stuff in the denominator yet. It's a, it uses a special rule called the quotient rule, which we will learn Well, maybe, maybe tomorrow. Because it's summer school. It just goes by so fast. Who knows? It's either tomorrow or Monday. I'll show it to you. So, so we have to divide it. But do you see how everything is almost ready to go? In fact, you might even want to rewrite this last part here with the x in the numerator already, because you know you're going to need it, right? The x in the denominator becomes x to the negative first. So we might as well go ahead and set that up anyway. <coughs> now we take the derivative. The derivative of 19 is 0. The derivative of negative 0.05x is negative 0.05. And the derivative of negative 120 times x to the negative 1 is positive 120 times x to the negative 2. And if you want to write that with uh, positive exponents, that would be 120 over x squared. Now evaluate at 180. So this is negative 0 0.05 plus 120 over 180 squared. And that 
that's negative 0 0.0463. And the interpretation is that average profit is decreasing at 0 0.0463 dollars per radio. at a production level of 180 radios. <coughs> and then lastly, Estimate the average profit per radio if 181 radios are produced. Now, this question is implying that we should use the information from the previous two in order to calculate this next answer. 181 radios is one more than everything we've calculated so far. So the average profit, well, let me write it out this way. The average profit at 181 is approximately the average profit at 180 plus the change in the average profit, which is the marginal average profit at 180. Again, this is everything that we were doing yesterday when we were looking at that graph. We noticed that the derivative tells me how it is changing at that moment, and then uh, and then we're going to tack that on, and, and we're going to add it one time because we're going up by one radio. So this is $9.33 plus negative 0 0.0463, which is approximately $9.28 per radio. And that makes sense. I mean, I've rounded it to the nearest penny because we're dealing with money. But it makes sense. The average profit at 180 radios was $9.33. The marginal profit, marginal average profit at 180 radios was negative 0.0463. So you're basically losing about four and a half cents for every radio you're producing thereafter. Now this is a local phenomenon at 180, so we can use it to calculate the next one over to be 181. You can do this a few times out, but remember it's just like the tangent line. The further away you get from where the tangent line was created, the worse your approximations become. But this is pretty accurate.